Hi everyone, it's Reading Adam back again, and today I have a interesting book, different from other ones that I've been reading lately. Uh, I've been taking a break from very brief break from literature and nonfiction to read *The Moat in God's Eye*. Now. That guy right there is a Modi who lives in the moat. God's eye is a star system. Uh, just to, so, in case you're not sure, there are, there will be a little bit of spoilers here. I assume that anyone watching this has already read the book as well. Um, if you if you haven't read it and you're considering reading it, definitely read it. It's well worth reading. Jerry Parnell recently passed away. And uh, I decided that it was time that I, I read this book. And why did I decide? Because, not just because he passed away, but because this is the oldest book I own. This is the book I've owned the longest, I should say. Uh, I tried reading this as, I think, a 10-year-old boy, 8 or 9 or 10. And it was, of course, beyond me at that age. And I never got around to reading it since then. Um, I think I got to page 15 and then called it quits. I was immediately intimidated because in the beginning of the book, there's one of one of these. I don't know if you've ever seen one of those. Like it's a list of characters, and uh, that's always intimidating in the beginning of a book. A list of characters, useful reference later on. Most books you don't need something like that. I find you just kind of understand who is who as you read. Um, there was a book I read recently, Doctor Zavago that did that and it's very intimidating when it's a russian book i also read a book uh, house by the meddler tree which is an italian classic and also had one of those lists of characters at the beginning that one i had to constantly refer back to and then the russian one well if you know anything about russian literature uh, or the russian language or russian names it's that a single person could have like five different names and that i find that frustrating anyway Back to Moten God's Eye. Finally glad, I, I mean, I'm glad that I finally got around to reading this interesting and awesome book. Uh, it's a science fiction book, obviously, if you can tell already by the, the cover. A good cover should tell you kind of the genre. And um, it's about, in brief, it's about a... Uh, Human, it's it's a thousand years in the future, so it's three thousand seventeen, and uh, it's about humans who have expanded across multiple habitable worlds. Some worlds they've had to terraform, and um, they haven't yet met any alien species that are intelligent. They've met microscopic species, some sort of rat type species, but they haven't met any intelligent species so in there's a timeline that kind of describes some of the history of the past thousand years which was interesting and useful um but they it's it's about first contact with this species and what that leads to which is interesting in and of itself but depending on like any it'd be interesting if every single author ever uh, wrote a book like that, and you'd have a completely different story every time. Totally different technology used. Uh, the aliens would be completely different from each other. Um, some obviously anthropomorphic elements would remain. You know, they'd have, they'd probably have language. They'd have uh, physical bodies. I don't know stuff that that is. It's hard to uh, like. Why do you need to be so creative that they don't have that? Why do they have to be that alien? So I found it just very interesting. I really liked the way that, so that the aliens in this, they're, they're called Modis, after, named after the, the planet, the system that they're in, which is called the Moat. Um, I thought that they were very interestingly created, uh, designed, so to speak. As you can see from the cover, I'll bring this back up here. As you can see from the cover, they're... Um, They're not symmetrical. They have, they're a little bit asymmetrical on the, their right arms. With the, the, the two arms on the right hand are their kind of technological arms. The arm on the left is is a uh, oh sorry, their left and right 
Yeah, sorry, uh, just looking at mirror images here, so it's confusing my left and right. But uh, as you can see, I mean, that's what they, they're described to look like. They have the giant ear. They have a overly built, muscular right arm uh, or left arm. And then their two other arms are small, and but, but work quickly and are, are their advanced technological arms. Anyway, um, there's only one group of these. These guys are divided up into different subspecies. They're mostly the same, but certain groups, the mediators are the only ones that speak. The engineers are their, their tech, mechanical, fix-it-up, support type of uh, people. They have farmers. They have masters. They have transport guys. They have warriors. And the warriors, they hide from the humans, and that kind of leads to the story building element. But it, it was this was a this is a nice break from the literature I've been recently reading because this just kind of a bit you get the suspenseful moment where you have uh, a first climax, which is when the humans first come across a Modi probe, and then you have that builds up to the final climax, which is. Uh, how the humans and Modi's essentially ultimately deal with each other given their situation. So their situation is that they're, um, and, and this whole talk won't be, this whole discussion won't be completely about the book, but I'm just trying to remind myself of, of the, the timeline, the storyline and uh, certain elements that are interesting. So, so the big, the big thing about this that was, makes it more interesting is that the Modis are more intelligent than humans. They're more technologically capable, uh, even though they don't have certain elements of human technology, such as standardized parts and measurements. Uh, they, they custom build everything, but they're really, really good at it. And they work very fast. The brown Modis are the engineer Modis, and they're they're really fast. I thought it was very interesting when the humans first come in contact with the living brown Modi. That's the first living one they come in contact with. I just thought it was really neat. It was cool that the Modi would 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 uh, it, it it looked at an officer's pistol that he had, and it it took the pistol completely apart and then put it back together again, and then it looked at the guy's hand and felt his hand all over. And then it took the pistol part, you know, and then it modified the pistol. And uh, it was described as the modified pistol was like, like it was, it was a huge improvement. Like it was built to perfectly fit with a human hand where it practically aims itself. It was, was the description. And I just thought that was really neat. So the, the brown modis are capable of um, disassembling anything and rebuilding it as a better version of itself. And they had these little pet size uh animal modis that they look like modis but they're miniature and they do the same thing they're they're helpers they get into places that are that are um i guess less accessible to the bigger modis and and that ends up being a problem that's sort of like rats aboard a ship but they overbreed so a big problem with the modis is they overbreed um, their physiology they're just they're they have to get preg they they change their sex um, after they get pregnant and, and they have to get pregnant or they die. Um, the mediator Modis are mules. They're, they're bred specifically to keep the peace between the Modis because they're very warlike. They keep that completely from the humans, but they're very warlike. And uh, I just thought it was a very interesting setup for this alien race. I thought it was, it was, it was just interesting. Um, but also set up for a good solid story. So it's well worth reading. It's clearly, I, I get why it's said to be a masterpiece. And there, there's one thing that I wanted to discuss about the masterpiece. You know, why, why would something like this be a masterpiece compared to something else you've m maybe read that was very similar? I think, I think it's a masterpiece because, um, after the last climate, like, concluding the story in a satisfactory way that doesn't turn this into a series although it was probably although it's clearly a series because in the in the back of the book there's the gripping hand is apparently part two and, and i'm sure they could have made 
um, I don't know how many other books are in this series. I'm only interested in reading this one. Maybe I'll read the other one at some point. Um, I'm in, very interested in reading stuff by Larry Niven at this point, but I, I, I tend to shy away from series in science fiction and fantasy. I'm not interested in reading a, a, a five part series, a 13 part series, uh, volumes and volumes. Uh, like when I read Ender's Game, I know that there are a bunch of other uh, sequels to that, but I've, I was ne I've never had the least desire interest in reading those. I, w I have yet to read Dune. I'm going to read Dune and, uh, but I'm not interested in any of the sequels to Dune. I'm not interested in however many of those he wrote. Uh, Wheel of Time, stuff like that. I don't want to get into a, a giant long series. Um, for whatever reason, I just don't, other than Lord of the Rings, I don't find that I particularly enjoy. I like one, one tight book. Um, nonfiction is different because... Sometimes there's just so much information that, and so much detail that you go into multiple volumes. I have no problem with that. Sorry. But I do have, I do seem to have a problem with a giant epic story. I'm just not, maybe it's just not my taste. Maybe at some point, maybe I feel like I don't have the time. I want to move on to the next book. I want one neat, tight package. And Moten God's Eye does that. You feel like it could go on and on, and you're kind of wondering what's going to happen. Where's this going to go? But he wrapped, they conclude, they wrap it up very neatly. And maybe this is the genius of having two great authors write a book um, rather than just one guy doing it. You being able to bounce off ideas of each other to each other to figure out how they're going to end it. Because um, it because there was one point where I was starting to get bored near the end. It's right after the humans leave the Modi system. They're deciding what they're going to do. It's a little bit of a kind of stepping back, a little bit of relaxation. And I, I didn't find that, that. That was the most boring part of the book to me. And I was kind of thinking like, uh-oh, there's still like 100 pages left. Is this going to end well? Like, like what's going on here? Um, is this going to fall apart during the end? Because some books fall apart at the end. But no, once I got past that brief boring period, like it really wrapped up very nicely. And I think I, that's why I would consider it and agree, or at least agree with anybody who says it's a masterpiece of those authors. Um, that's why I would agree, because to me, it would be very difficult to wrap this thing up because you have such a giant subject you're dealing with. And there's so much fertile ground to go in many different directions. You know, do you start a war between the Modis and humans? Do they come to some sort of negotiation or peace? Uh, do they start trade? Does do you, do you set things up so that you can create a second story, or do you try to wrap things up where if you never create a second story, uh, it's good all and all on its own, and it wraps up very nicely. So I think that's just. I thought that was swell. I thought that was partially why these guys are worth reading. Uh, this wasn't my first time reading Jerry Purnell. It was my first time reading Larry Niven. But Jerry Purnell, I read the Janus series years and years ago. And I really did like Janus series, but I didn't... When I read it, I wasn't paying attention to uh, the authors of the books I was reading. It's weird. When I first started reading, when I decided I wanted to read a lot of books, I didn't really pay attention to the authors. I paid attention to titles. And uh, as I've read a lot more... I'm a lot more interested in authors than I am titles. So like if I really like an author's work with one book, I really want to read his other work. Before I wasn't like that. It's just, it's weird how I made that transition. I would recommend that you just start off with going after authors as opposed to certain titles. Maybe the great books kind of... Uh, if you see great books lists or you see book lists, you're you're focused on titles. You're not focused on authors. I'd like to see author lists more often. Um, like these authors, you could read all their works, and you're gonna be you're gonna be well well served by reading all their works as as opposed to just a title here or there. But you sample them by reading a title here or there. So here's their best work. Here's their their more most interesting work. And then if you like that, then read the rest of the author's stuff. Anyway. 
that's too big of a tangent. I want to stop that there. Uh, some of the other notes that I have here, uh, some other points I wanted to make before I, I go into too much, I want to get into some discussion that's not the book itself. So the book was written in the 1970s. Um, that was an era where overpopulation and uh, resource depletion were, were big issues in the intellectual sphere. Now, I wasn't around during that time, so I only know this from reading history and hearing people talk about it, but overpopulation and the end of the world through uh, the end of oil, uh, oil resources being gone, uh, created these panics, and it seemed like things were maybe uh, going to end. Uh, things were going to get much worse in the future, that humanity had stopped growing, reached its peak, and was now going to fizzle out like rats aboard a ship. Um, so it's it's kind of, uh, it's the book sort of addresses that through the Modi c civilization, and it's, it's interesting because the Modis are a reflection of maybe what will happen to our own humanity in the future if we don't ever develop the ability to expand beyond our own solar system. And that's very interesting. Sorry about all the, the drink that I'm having this particular video. I want to keep my mouth moist. Um, doing a lot of talking tends to do that. So the, this is a very interesting thing, um, this idea of what if we get stuck in our solar system? What if we use up all of our uh, physical resources, our fossil fuels? What if we use up phosphorus and we run out of fertilizer? You know, what happens when oil becomes too difficult to extract? Uh, now, I don't believe that those are issues that will permanently end civilization, because I think that there's plenty of opportunity for alternatives to become active sources of fuel, replenishable energy, I do believe is, is possible, particularly alcoholic-based energy for, for vehicles. And vehicles can always be redesigned so that they're more fuel efficient. Right now, they're primarily designed for safety, um, but they can always be redesigned to be uh, far more f fuel efficient than they are now. They, they're not so much now because of the weight. Weight is a big problem, but you need weight for safety. Uh, the other thing is um, it, economic incentive. There's not a big incentive right now to develop alternatives, but once oil actually does become too expensive to extract, then uh, you'll see uh, economic alternatives pop up quite quickly. I'm sure car companies are probably sitting on a lot of patents uh, that would would solve many of the issues people are afraid of. Uh, because transportation, being able to transport resources from point A to point B is more important than just having the resources uh, already at point A and point B. In my mind. So um, it's very interesting. The Modis have a long, they've been around a lot longer than humans. They've been civilized for a million years. However, uh, they have cycles to their civilization. Their civilization grows and grows and grows and then collapses back to barbarism. Then grows and grows and grows and grows and collapses back to barbarism because they can't get out of, they, they always out grow their resources, their food supplies. Um, there's just too, too many of them, overpopulation. So this is something that humans will eventually have to address because right now we produce more food than we need, and that's a great thing uh, because it makes food affordable and people aren't starving en masse. So that's a good thing, but eventually, eventually, humans might might overpopulate. Now I don't know if they won't in the way that Modi's did because Modi's don't have a choice; they have to reproduce or they die. And it's you know if you're programmed to survive, you know if you're genetically programmed to survive and genetically programmed to care for your children, uh, you're not going to have 
situations where they're choosing to die rather than reproduce just so the whole race can survive because of another issue, which is power and control. So the Modis want, you know, just like human beings, we want power, we want control. And if one population is purposely uh, not reproducing, another population is going to take over. They're just going to see that as an opportunity to overpower them and win, and then it just creates the cycle all over again. So it's kind of like in the West, you know, it's weird because in the West, um, people have been afraid of overpopulation for a while. And what happens? People reproduce less. They have less children. Some people don't have any children because uh, they keep hearing about how, oh, no, there's going to be overpopulation. Oh, no, we, we got we to gotta reduce the amount of people we have. But then on the other hand, you have like, Oh, we need to bring in tons of immigrants because uh, we don't have the population and we need the population to grow the economy or everything will go bad. And it's like, okay, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So you're just, what you're doing is just replacing the native population with a non native population who might see this as an opportunity to, to take over. Who knows? Uh, as one nation state really weakens it's 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 in human history history it's it's completely normal in human history for people to take over areas that are depopulated or weakened uh look at the history of the u.s with native americans and how much that they just took over so much territory because of depopulation um Anyway, I don't want to get too much into that, but but it's an interesting it's an interesting thing. Are we the Modis? Are we uh, current physics and and like right now we don't have any way of getting to another star system. If we find another planet in another solar system that's like twenty one light years away that could be habitable, we have no way of getting there. So the Alderson drive is what the humans have in this book, The Molten God's Eye. The Alderson drive is something that allows them to travel. Uh, beyond the speed of light, basically like warp drive, so they can get to these other solar systems. The the Modis, the the only time they're able to get out of their system, there's just one pathway to get out of their system, and they send a probe through it using a light sail, so a giant sail propelled by a beam of light, and um, it took them like a hundred some years to to get the probe out of their their system out of just general space to uh to contact uh an advanced civilization that they realized existed so so it's interesting like what if we do find another what if we do find evidence that there's another civilized race out there we have no way of getting to them the best way we have of getting to them is sending light speed information signals to them but by the time they get them and then relay something back to us it'll so much time will have passed that is it really worth it will it make any difference so it's just it's it's an interesting um it's interesting discussion it's fertile ground for for some nice discussion about where will humanity ultimately end up especially if we're just trapped on this planet if we i mean maybe we can get to mars and and populate mars but um what if we can never get out of our solar system <laughs> you know what if we just can't what if nobody ever develops technology that can can uh, escape our solar system so that i mean that's that's an interesting thing and and that makes people wonder well what if there are tons and tons of advanced civilizations all over the universe but they all run into this same problem where they're all t separated from each other no one can ever contact anyone and they all ultimately die out on their own planets or recede back into a a long time of death you know like how many planets out there are just dead rock uh, will the Earth eventually be dead rock? I don't know. I mean, if uh, entropy has anything to say about that, maybe it will. So, 
I, I I find that those are some of the things that I was thinking about as I was reading this book and reflecting on after reading it. Um, what's going to happen to humanity? Are, is humanity going to end up like the Modi's just collapse, then civilization collapse, and civilization collapse, and civilization? Because the Modi's have long since used all of their physical resources, and they've gone through the collapses all the time. They have interesting uh, museums set up around the planet, and the purpose of the museum is uh, for to restart, to re-jump civilization and try it again and see if they can succeed. Um, it, and it's interesting that even the, the door mechanism is designed so that uh, the primitive modis can't get into it. They have to at least have some form of astronomy in place before they can actually successfully get inside um, to start restart civilization. So they need to get to that point before they can they can uh, start rebuilding. It's interesting. Um, it's an interesting concept. I find it quite interesting. But let's see if there's any other points that I that I wanted to go through here about this book. I don't want to keep this too long because I'll start to ramble and won't have any great points for you all. So I think I'm going to end there. Um, if I can think of anything else, I'll make a part two for this. But I want to end there so this is not too long-winded. And um, again, I very much enjoyed this book, Molten God's Eye. Uh, well worth the read. I don't know if you can get your hands on a copy, uh, if they're all bought up now, because Mr. Parnell recently passed away. I read his, uh, the, his eulogy from his son, and, and very interesting person. Sounded like um, sounded like a great guy and and superbly well read. It seems that every author uh, that I've that I find out about that author, it seems that they all just read a ton. They read a ton, but uh, I'm, I'm I'm running out of things to say. I'm rambling at this point, so I'll just end it there. Thanks again for watching this video. Uh, read this book. Click on the link below to my blog to purchase this book if you'd like to to uh, take a look at it. And uh, that is, uh, again, an affiliate link. So, um, yeah, like this video, subscribe, share this video. Until next time, um, this is Reedy Adam. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.